in essence, the market is almost divided into the local market. Mm -hmm. And within the local market, you have what we call old money and new money. Mm. And then there is the tourism market, which is almost resilient to the local economies. With the war in Ukraine and Russia going and the EU imposing sanctions on the Russian market, the global market and industries are going through a dependency crisis with most countries banking on Russia and Ukraine for their import, and there is global supply disruptions and inflationary pressures. Welcome again. This is a guest segment on Africa Business Radio. I am Chukunonsu Modi. Today we are looking at the diamond industry, both global and local, and how much the lingering war has also affected it. And joining me to discuss the impact of this war on the diamond industry is Yari Shimansky, CEO Shimansky Diamond and Tanzanite Jewelers. Welcome Yari, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yes, hi, um, welcome to all you listeners and thank you for having me at the show. Okay, thank you. Now let's start with this. How has the jewelry market, you know, evolved over the years? Um, so the jewelry market over the years created a lot of change in custody when consumer demanding authenticity, okay. fair trade, sustainability. They're very much interested in where the gold came from, where the diamond came from. It obviously symbolizes happy moment. Mm engagement ring and another milestone and they want to make sure that, that they're doing the right thing from a conscious perspective and also helping the environment, human rights and so I think the consumer is quite conscious about what is it that they are buying mm. and where does it come from. Mm. All right. Okay, now let's talk about this war between Ukraine and Russia. Now, it's, it's no secret that it has affected the global market, uh, different industries at large. But now for the diamond industry, especially globally, how exactly has it hit, you know, um, the industry? Can you give us stats too? A very good question. So the USA announced the sanction of importing diamond from Russia mm. um, in March 11th. Okay. Um, having said that Russia exports most of the uncut diamonds into India, um, when India polishing 97% of the world diamond mm. by volume, and, and by the time the diamond is being transformed from an uncut diamond to polish, is no longer considered a Russian diamond by definition. So the sanctions have not been so effective so far. But what's happened, interestingly, the big brands, um, especially in the US and in Europe, mm -hmm. like uh, Cartier, like Tiffany, like Pandora, like other brands, they announced that they will also not buy any diamond that is origin from Russia. Mm. And because you can't tell in most cases, they're insisting on knowing where the diamond came from. So, for example, diamond from Canada, Diamond from Botswana, diamond from South Africa are gaining more popularity and people demanding to know the origin. Mm. So I think this is quite a, quite a big impact. Um, the other point to remember from an uncut diamond to a Polish diamond that reached the market is about four months journey. Mm. The war in Ukraine is about maybe under 40 days, but if it will continue and we hope it won't, and it will pass the three to four months mark, mm -hmm. there's going to be a major shortage on the market that will cause price increase. Russia produces about a third of the world diamond. So it can cause um, quite a shortage. And, and and let's see how things un unfold. But I think, I mean, for us in the industry, the biggest concern is the stackable inflation that happened from the supply chain. Now with oil, fertilizer, food prices will go mm -hmm, up, mm -hmm. interest rate are rising, and consumer will may have less disposal income going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that may have a larger effect on diamond and other luxury goods as a well. whole. Mm. Very true, because if uh, food and the rest is going up, they might not 
one has to eat first before even thinking of buying diamonds or jewelries. So I, I, I get your point. Um, looking at the local industry now, let me use South Africa. What is the state of the South African jewelry market compared to the rest of the world? So that's also again, it's a very complex question. Mm-hmm. But in essence, the market is almost divided into the local market, mm-hmm. and within the local market, you have what we call old money and new money, mm. and then there is the tourist, the tourism market, which is almost resilient to the local economy. So there is definitely more interest in jewelry. There's a lot of new money. There is the the new market that the people call it black diamond in the diamond industry. Mm. That, that are rising up in terms of income and they want to spend more diamond on jewelry. Um, on the other hand, like you say, rightly so, the cost of living mm. is there. Um, what we also seen, there need to be more investment in educating people to come into the trade, to create more craftsmen, mm-hmm. more skill, investments in technology in order to maintain the, the industry basically growing from within compared to importing jewelry where most company import their jewelry from India or from China, there are still very few that manufacture locally. So there are great opportunities in, in manufacturing, but it's about skill, development, maybe a bit of less red tape um, <clears throat> from the government. Um, so this is the main analysis on the local market. Um, and the other area, South African by tradition, by classic safe design, not as much as fashion and in diamond jewelry. And I think because the cost of living and disposal income proportionally is lower than somebody in Europe or in America, mm. they will rather buy something safe that that may not go out to fashion in in three years or five years. So it's a, it's a different mindset. Mm, yes. So are you saying that despite, you know, this um, war and its effect, um, the diamond industry is still a good place to invest? Um, look, definitely so. So we do see an emerging category um, that is actually accelerated during the Russian invasion, which is investment diamonds. A lot of people witnesses um, confiscation of assets like like super yacht, like, like residential, like frozen bank account by the US or the Europe on, 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 on other, um, Russian residents that are very wealthy. So a lot, there's a lot of investment now into diamond, which is a hard asset. You can put it in your pocket. You can take it anywhere. Mm. Nobody can seize it. And it's also maintained is, is rent dollar values. So if, if the currency will get weaker, at least your diamond will maintain its dollar value. Plus the appreciation over time, as, as diamond do appreciate as, as time go by. Mm, okay, okay, all right. Speaking of this war, still, you know, that's all we are talking about. It's impact on the diamond industry. Now we know that what you said there's a shortage. So are there alternative routes? You know, mm-hmm. a way the diamond industry can bounce back from the effects <laughs> of the war. Okay, so so there will be a certain shortage in certain countries mm. and in certain brands. Um, but for example, China and India, which are a major consumer uh, market that consume diamond and they are not part of the West sanction, they will actually observe the diamond that are being sanctioned to go to the US. So you may have Tiffany, Cartier or, 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 this, or Pandora and the European conscious brand maybe having more difficulty to obtain diamond, but um, the trade and the retailer and the industry in China and India will consume that uh, that diamond that do not come from Russia to Europe or America, they will consume mm-hmm. it in China. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the impact is quite severe on the Russian industry, but on the branded company, I think, yes. And, and it may also open the door um, and accelerate the growth of the laboratory or man-made diamond if the shortage will accelerate and it will become a more permanent feature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, in other words, uh, it's so open doors for, you know, more people to come into the market. Yes, there's also the uh, laboratory 
made the diamonds today on the market. They're called um, Lab Gone Diamonds. Okay. It's gaining popularity in the US, in some other countries. Not so much in South Africa it's, as it's quite new. And South Africa is also a producing country. Um, but if there will be a shortage and there will be a gap, some, something will fill that gap. And probably Lab Gone Diamond are positioned to fill the gap if it will exist. But again, because you are in South Africa, which produce diamond, when the tourists come and when a local person wants to buy a diamond, they still want an authentic, genuine, natural South African diamond. So mm-hmm. I think, I think for South Africa, it's not a major impact beside the inflation and, and, and the cost of living going up. Mm, okay. Now, before this war started, the market was pushing through, you know, like you said, South Africa has its own uh, um, hands too in the diamond industry. Now, what are jewelry trends to look out for in this year? Um, so, you do have obviously the classic jewelry that always stay on. The biggest trend that we see going in South Africa and also worldwide Women buying power is on the increase. Mm. So a lot of women are buying for themselves. And when it's come to customization, a lot of women are getting involved in their own design of the engagement ring or even customers. Mm-hmm. And, and I think having those services and having the ability to sit with the customer, get an input and, and create a design and deliver a product, I think it's quite important. It's the days that this is what we have to sell take it or leave it mm. are a little bit in the past a lot of people want something unique they want an emotional input they want something special and I think that's also quite a growing trend and also in South Africa mm. okay so people want uh, diamonds that are tailored made for them and the jewelry design so if somebody wants a ring and they want the band to be a little, a little bit wider mm. they want to add some diamond mm. they want to have a special message engraved inside the ring and they want to modify so I think they want that personal service like, like a bespoke custom made the same as they're having a wedding dress made specially for them compared to buying it off the shelf so there's there's a growing a growing segment that demand customization okay alright now let's let's speak about your company now what makes you unique um, you know, different from the rest in the diamond industry, and how exactly has the company put Africa on the map as regards this industry? So, I think we're quite we're among the very few companies, even worldwide, mm-hmm. that we own two diamond cutting and polishing factories in Cape Town. Oh. We own our own jewelry manufacturing, so we buy once a month and we hand pick the best diamond from the diamond mines, we buy the metal from the South African mine. The customers that are coming to Captain can see the diamond cutting and polishing or jewelry making in front of their eyes. So they have that, that proof. So I think the journey for mine to finger is quite unique. Um, we also pioneered platinum in South Africa, which is still a fairly undiscovered metal for many shoppers. Mm-hmm. And, and I think also the, the level of craftsmanship, innovation, passion, and always putting the customer in the center of what we do and, and giving the best for the customer. I think I think it set us apart compared to more company will import, like I say, finished jewelry from, from Asia, put a markup and put them for sale. We offer very different. You can come to our stores, even do it online. We will design you a ring, send you a visual of the ring. If you like it, we'll have it made within a few days. And again, cutting and polishing the diamond, making the jewelry, it's, it's, it's an authentic experience. It's different by design and, 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 it, and, and I think people can, can see and feel and feel that passion uh, when they wear the jewelry. Mm-hmm. Besides the fact that our quality of craftsmanship, it's, it's, it's really, it's on a high level. Um, we do have also a showroom on Fifth Avenue in New York. So we also supply our jewelry to customers in the USA and from there worldwide. And, and we have a very strong connection with Cape Town, New York. And I think it's also quite unique to be able to service customers um, anywhere else in the world from our um, 
the Yorkshire Home and Office there. Mm. Interesting what your company is doing, especially, you know, because it's in Africa here. So it, it's definitely setting pace for other people to join in. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for Africa to go out through the world. And I just think that a lot of people in South Africa or Africa need exposure. They need to get out there and, 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 and share the uniqueness that Africa have. With, with the rest of the world because um, there, there is a certain magic in Africa that you don't get yes. in, in the Western world. Mm. Yes, true. I agree with you. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for speaking with us. Uh, I did have a good time discussing Drury with you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, and again, all the best. And, and let's put Africa on the map. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, that was Yaya Shimanskai, CEO Shimanskai Diamond and Tantanai Drillers. Stay tuned for more.